CFO Studio is sponsored by Real Estate Strategies Corporation, advisors to CFOs, management, and boards of directors in the acquisition and disposition of leased and owned real estate. Visit us online at realstrat.com. Hi, I'm your host, David Danik. Welcome to CFO Studio. Today we're joined by Gordon Bryant, Chief Financial Officer of Pfister Energy. Gordon has a BA from Murray State University and an MBA from Wharton. He has three decades of financial experience, including serving as Senior VP in Investment Banking at Lazard Ferrer and the East Coast Director of Structured Finance at SunPower. Gordon is a member of the Association for Corporate Growth and Mercer Investors, a Princeton, New Jersey equity investor group. Pfister Energy is a New Jersey-based alternative energy company that specializes in stackable technologies in the renewable energy sector. Today we'll be talking about financially thriving as an alternative energy company in today's market. Gordon, thanks for coming by. Thank you so much. David, it's a pleasure being here. Yep. Um, I, I just want you for a second, if you could, because I gave a brief uh, introduction and description of Pfister. Can you uh, explain in a little more de uh, depth for our viewers what the company actually is and does? Sure, Dave. Pfister Energy is an alternative energy company which does a lot of solar power work, but we also provide a broad range of alternative energies uh, solutions that we characterize as stackable technologies to best meet the needs of our customers. Mm -hmm. Those solutions may include solar PV, solar thermal, wind, energy efficiency, rainwater harvesting, daylighting, and could un also include fuel cells and backup emergency generation. So you guys really do it all? Pretty much. Pretty much. We don't do nuclear power yet. Ah, interesting. But you're getting there maybe one day. It's possible. Good. Um, so s let's jump into it. State and federal financial incentives for alternative energy projects have generally had a declining trend. How does a small East Coast-based al alternative energy company uh, survive and thrive in, in that kind of environment? We've heard a lot, I think, from folks that who are just in the solar power industry about how the markets have deteriorated, particularly in places like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, even in Massachusetts, due to the decline in financial incentives for solar power. I think there are three-pronged strategy approach that a company needs to have to survive and thrive in today's market. One is a very tight control on cost, mm -hmm. and you can do that by having your own equipment and own construction crews. Secondly, a non-capital intensive means of expanding into gif different geographic regions so that you have geographic diversification without incurring huge amounts of cost for bricks and mortar and debt. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, is having a very strongly defined, well-defined uh, strategic market differentiation approach. For Pfister Energy, that means stackable technology approach where we combine different alternative energy technologies to reduce the payback period for our customers mm -hmm. so that even in a time of declining financial incentives, the projects still make economic sense. Right, so accelerating that payback is, is really key. That's, that's a big point. Big point. Um, so what is the distributed generation sector of the solar power market, and why is this sector often viewed as underserved by financial mm -hmm. Uh, markets and you know maybe throw a couple of potential solutions sure. in, in there for us. Well first let's start off maybe from the 30,000 sure. foot level. Distributed generation is the way that power generation started out mm -hmm. in for the whole industry under Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. Direct current, um, the power generation was located at the site where the power was right. used. There wasn't a need for transmission for all these power lines that are currently across the landscape. In the solar power industry, we've seen the sectors typically divided up into three, residential, 
commercial industrial, which is typically referred to as distributed generation, mm -hmm. and then large-scale utility. Got it. Um, as far as financing goes, both the residential and the utility scale uh, portions of, of the market have well-established techniques to accomplish their financing needs. For the utility scale sector of solar power, we can simply utilize the project finance techniques that have been utilized traditionally for power generation for decades. For the residential scale, we can securitize the individual residential leases into something like a mortgage-backed security. Mm. It's a distributed generation sector that has been underserved because the typical financing techniques, and we can talk about later sure. more about these, have been power purchase agreements and lease arrangements, which are negotiated individually for each project. Mm. Massive friction cost uh, of time, opportunity, and capital just to get those done. So what what is... Uh I've heard you mention before in the past crowdfunding, mm -hmm. Jobs Act. What, what, what is that? Okay. Right. Some of the um, legislation that's been recently proposed could provide good solutions for distributed generation financing. For example, in the spring, Congress enacted a law which is referred to the acronym of Jobs Act, which will reduce the uh, hurdles in accessing individual investors mm. for projects and enable so-called crowdfunding to occur over, over websites. There's also legislation enacted to enable investors in alternative energy and solar power projects to utilize master limited partnerships, which have been successfully utilized in the oil and gas sector for decades. Mm. And currently that's not available for retail investors, but that legislation is referred to as the Master Limited Partnership Parity Act. Uh. So you're drawing a little bit on the past and hoping to combine that with some future um, methods uh, as far as that goes. That's right. And <coughs> we feel there's a huge pool of potential investors in the retail sector that it's currently impossible to access due to the way that incentives are structured and current tax laws. And we can talk about that maybe a little okay. bit more. Um, what do you think the most frequently utilized financing techniques for solar power projects are and, and what are the key advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. to those? Probably 80% of solar power projects are financed with a power purchase agreement. And under the power purchase agreement, a third party financing counterparty will monetize the tax credits mm. and depreciation benefits and we can talk about what those tax credits sure. are the customer for the project then agrees to buy power under an arrangement similar to what it has with its current utility. So the customer has no down payment to make, wow. no capital up front, and yet continues to make its power payments as if uh, all the power was supplied by the utility, while a portion, perhaps um, the bulk of the power consumed during the day is provided by the solar power. Interesting. So the the trend, the underlying trend is to see, it seems, is to be to make it easier for that end user, that customer, and also uh, less of a financial burden on that end user. Correct. There are other techniques that can be used if the customer wants to own the project more quickly uh, because power purchase agreements are typically a 20 or 25 year tenor. Uh -huh. Lease arrangements can also be set up where the lease arrangement would, would be typically in the 7 to 10 or 12 year range. Oh, so you have a good amount of time to, to amortize the costs and, and pay them off. Great. Um, so what is tax equity and why is that important for alternative energy? Right. When we projects. talked about the power purchase agreement, we talked about monetizing tax, tax uh, equity. Uh -huh. And if you're a government and you're looking to encourage solar power, we still see solar power cost above what traditional fossil fuel market prices right, are. Especially that initial investment. So there are a couple of ways to, to provide a subsidy. You could provide direct subsidies. Mm -hmm. You could require utilities to pay above market prices under, say, a feed-in tariff, and we can talk about what that is later. That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, or we could provide tax credits. And the problem with providing tax credits are that in, in order to utilize those, the user has to have consistent profitability over, over time. Most solar and alternative energy developers have volatile revenues mm. and perhaps aren't even 
profitable uh, over that time period. So we need to then to turn to a third party provider who can monetize the investment tax credit mm -hmm. and also monetize the depreciation benefits. That may sound like a broad range of folks that are out there, but typically we've seen a handful of financing companies and only a few uh, corporations. Google is, is prominent there as one of the corporations that are involved in providing tax mm -hmm. equity for alternative energy projects. Really? So there's some inefficiency in the use of tax equity. Some folks who've looked at this have suggested the inefficiencies add maybe as much as three to 400 basis points in the cost of financing an individual mm -hmm. solar project. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously most people think, let's just put a panel on the roof and let's go. But to just in, in any industry, any business, you have to keep those costs and checks in line and make it work. Um, and it seems like your company is really trying to pull it all together and, and combine all, all those different strategies to make it a viable alternative. I try to put myself in the shoes, David, of, of the CFO of a corporation mm -hmm. and ask myself, okay, if I were the CFO of XYZ Corporation in New Jersey, would I put solar on my roof? What would be the her threshold questions I would want answered? Right, and the hurdles. What do I need yeah. to see to make that Absolutely. viable for me? Absolutely. Um, so my next question, what is a solar power feed-in tariff? As, as you just mentioned, what are the key advantages and disadvantages of that? Um, a feed-in tariff is a situation where rather than having the customer of the project, the host of the project, mm -hmm paying for power, a utility pays, and an mm -hmm. above market rate. Feed-in right. tariffs have successfully been used in Europe, in Ontario, Canada, and increasingly in jurisdictions in the U.S., although not on a national level yet. Um, we've seen them used in Long Island, in Gainesville, Florida. Mm -hmm. They will be used soon in Georgia, uh, the state of Georgia. Um, some of the issues are that the feed-in tariff will have only a specified amount of volume that can be included because you don't want, obviously, to have the utility having all of its power at an above market rate. Right. That would put the utility out of business. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, how do you allocate projects to participate in this feed-in tariff? On what sort of basis is it done? And secondly, what we're also seeing internationally as well as domestically is that feed-in tariffs either ratchet down in anticipation of lower cost mm -hmm. of solar power, or they're set at levels while they're above current market levels are still relatively low. For example, I'm from Kentucky originally. Right. Kentucky's power cost is around seven cents or so. That's what it is you in New York too. Yes. No, <laughs> With a zero after it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could set a feed-in tariff, let's say, at 10 cents, yeah. which would appear to be well above market in mm -hmm. Kentucky, and yet 10 cents in today's market with today's cost of solar power projects probably would not enable many projects to be completed in, in that state. Right. So you have to do a lot of due diligence. There are some limitations. You have to make sure that's all working correctly. What if, do you, I'm sure you have a website. Do you have a blog or any way that people that are interested in finding out more about that can, can pop on? Yes, for those uh, uh, viewers who might be interested in finding out more about uh, feed-in tariffs, go to our, our blog. Um, the website is fisterenergy.com, and we have a blog entitled, uh, Should There Be a National Feed-in Tariff for the U.S.? Okay, great. That's, that's perfect. Um, for investors interested in investing, um, in alternative energy companies, what are the key issues to review? I mean, you know, I want to invest in something maybe I know about, um, so I feel comfortable. Um, alternative energy is something that's definitely viable and definitely an investment possibility, but is there anything different or is it pretty much similar to other investments? Well, I think for any, any company you're looking to invest in, obviously mm -hmm. you want to look at sustainable profitability. Mm -hmm what is the likelihood the company can consistently grow its profits and continue to be um, profitable over the time period you're looking to invest in. Alternative energy companies are a little bit different because one, you've got 
um, the influence of the financial incentives, which vary by jurisdiction. Whoa. Although at the corp at the federal level, we do see the investment tax credit, but that expires currently now in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the key things I would look for is one: what is the means of strategic market differentiation that the company has. Okay. Um, I would also look at what are the geographic diversification means the company has. Hopefully those are achieved without spending a lot of capital for bricks right. and mortar because those markets might change and you need the flexibility to meet those changing needs. Right. Certainly strength of management and vision are, are key. Um, so those are sort of the three things sure. I would look at. So not so dissimilar from others, but just uh, maybe a little less of a track record because it's newer than some other investments that have been out there. It's not only newer, but there's also an element also of almost something like commodity market Ooh. risk in that you've got financial incentives that change and you've got pricing, particularly with solar panels that mm -hmm. rapidly change. Mm -hmm. So it's causes volatility in revenues, right. which have to be properly assessed and to some extent you just don't have a good handle on. Right. So for that reason it's a little bit like investing in let's say uh, grains like soybeans or corn or maybe natural gas mm -hmm. or, or oil. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about uh, financing issues that you face um, in the current market. Um, I know we uh, had, have read something about friction costs mm -hmm. and and things of that nature. Yeah. Well, let me focus on the distributed generation sure. side because that's the one, the side. Sure. One, I think that's the market sector that's going to grow most rapidly, Ooh. and yet is most underserved by financing. And so there's the greatest opportunity. Uh, one of my personal goals is to come up with the means to finance all these distributed generation right. projects with much lower friction cost and and get achieve achieve more closings. Um, currently, we need uh, financing counterparties to monetize the investment tax credit and the depreciation benefits, and that has to do with the way the federal government has set up the incentives. The investment tax credit accounts for 30% of the project cost, so if you've got a $9 million project, $3 million of that comes Ooh. from the investment tax credit. Right. It's very important you need to be able to monetize that. Um, under the non-feed-in tariff, where the customer buys the power, the financing counterparty has to look at each individual customer and decide if that customer is creditworthy. Mm. It's an easy decision if the customer has investment grade ratings from a publicly trading, a public uh, rating agency. Right. But majority of the customers in the distributed generation sector may not have that. Right. So how do you then assess the credit um, of the credit quality of this customer. And that's a, a labor-intensive process for the finance and counterparty. Um, secondly, you want to make sure that the customer's needs are met, both in tenor as well as, as what, what's required. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you're looking at a power purchase agreement, you'll see many customers view this as a contract that can be negotiated. But in many ways, a power purchase agreement, I've, I've told potential customers, is a little bit like an automobile engine. I remember when I was 10 or 11, uh, I wanted to make my dad's car go faster. Cool. I'm not sure why, but... Because uh, <laughs> you were going to be driving it uh, soon. Well, we'll be driving it soon. <laughs> so I noticed there were a lot of extra belts there, and I thought, well, maybe if you take some of these belts off and re reduce that, that should free up more horsepower for the engine. Uh -huh. um, if you take off the belt that drives the generator, it's not going to charge the battery. <laughs> If you take off the belt that drives the fan, it's going to overheat. There are provisions in a power purchase agreement that are there for one of three reasons, typically. Either for accounting reasons, either because or the federal tax code requires them, or the investor needs them for its credit Ooh, purposes. Interesting. So those are, are sort of thing in, uh, problems that you encounter in an in individual financing in today's distributed generation market that we're seeking to overcome. Fantastic. Um, so talk to me a, a little bit about growth, sales, acquisition. Mm -hmm. How do you grow Fister? Sure. Well, there's really only three ways to grow, I think, any company. Sales, um, uh, mark, uh, sales or licensing or acquisitions. 
And typically acquisitions and licensing have been sort of lumped together in, in business development in the uh -huh. sense of non-sales. Um, I think the easiest first thing that most companies will think of is getting a huge sales force and just mm. beating the streets or right. trying to identify appropriate customers and reaching those. And that's a very viable approach. Um, I think a non-capital means of expansion into ge different geographic regions makes a lot of sense, particularly mm -hmm. in the alternative energy sector mm -hmm. where you can see local market incentives be turned on and on off. And finally, acquisitions um, are a viable approach because you can acquire an additional customer base, sure. maybe even new technologies. However, studies have pointed out typically that the majority of acquisitions probably fail over time due to clashes Cult culture. culture. clash, yeah, exactly. That's, I think I found that as well. Uh, culture clash can be the downfall of what looks like on paper as a, as right. a good acquisition. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so obviously you're very busy, you're juggling a whole lot of stuff every day at work. Um, what, it, what, what do you think uh, typically are the top, at the top of the list for a financial officer in a company like yours, and also what keeps you up at night? Because it sounds like you never sleep. <laughs> um, well, I do have twin sons in college, so that does uh, does keep me up a little bit. Yeah, uh, that would uh, keep me up too. Yeah, so, so finally, a question about me. Uh, I think probably the biggest issue I deal with is making sure that I can get financing at the proper terms that meet the customer needs, that make the economics work, mm -hmm. and also maintain a long-term relationship with the financing counterparties because the last thing I want is for financing counterparties to incur what I would call investor fatigue where they say, oh, well, you showed us five other projects that were kind of mm -hmm. iffy from a credit standpoint and now you've got this other project mm -hmm. that, oh, we're not so sure we've got time to look at this. Right. So obtaining financing with, uh, while minimizing the friction cost is important because to me the highest pinnacle of, of my career and the most important most fulfilling thing for me is closing a transaction mm -hmm. that meets the customer needs and meets the investor needs and it's a balancing act to walk but it's sure. very fulfilling when you when you get there almost you know art meets science correct yep. yeah um, other issues in today's market I think insurance issues are all, have always been somewhat of concern because the alternative energy industry is relatively new, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that every insurance company is, is quite comfortable on, one, where to ca categorize these folks, and two, how do you evaluate the risk? I would argue that the risk of doing an alternative energy project are, are very low, particularly mm -hmm. a solar project. There's no moving parts. There's right. no combustion. There's relatively little maintenance required, and the solar panels typically we'll, we'll keep producing power for 30, 35 years. Yeah, that's fantastic. So we'll, we'll get them uh, one at a time, but we'll get them. Great. Gordon, thanks so much for coming David, by. It's, a it's a very interesting. I really appreciate it. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much. This is David Danik with Gordon Bryant of Fister Energy. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. The CFO's Guide to Understanding Corporate Real Estate Transactions is packed with almost 200 pages of insightful real estate acquisition and disposition strategies. Request your free copy online at cfostudio.com. CFO Studio is sponsored by Real Estate Strategies Corporation, advisors to CFOs, management, and boards of directors in the acquisition and disposition of leased and owned real estate. Visit us online at realstrat.com.